Five. Thanks, and welcome to the Wednesday, May 24th, 2023 meeting of the Redmond Planning Commission. I'll call this meeting to order and start with a roll call. Uh, Commissioner Woodyear. Present. Commissioner Aparna. Present. Commissioner Van Nyman. Present. Commissioner Sheffron. Present. Commissioner Nueva Camina. Present. Vice Chair Weston. Present. And I am Chair Sherry Nichols. Okay, I look for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And the agenda is approved. Uh, now I look for a motion to approve the Planning Commission meeting minutes and summaries. The summary for April 26th, uh, 2023. That's the only one we have. Um, so moved. Second. Uh, moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And it is approved. Uh, this is the point in the uh, meeting where we accept public comment from items from the audience for anything that is not the subject of a public hearing. And we have one person signed up. So uh, Clayton Graham, if you could come and uh, introduce yourself and uh, to the microphone and give us your address and then you'll have about three to five minutes. Okay, yeah, and sounds like I'm coming through okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Clayton Graham, I'm actually a land use attorney at Davis Wright Tremaine. We have offices in Seattle and Bellevue, and I guess I give 925th um, as my address because I'm typically in the Seattle office. I don't know the Bellevue office address off the top of my head. Um, so, thank you for the opportunity to comment on tonight's agenda. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a land use attorney. I've been representing developers in the city of Redmond for the better part of a decade. Um, including Nelson Legacy Group, which has some recent projects and also some planned projects coming down the pike. Um, I'm here to reiterate some concerns that we outlined in a letter to the commission dated May 5th, and I appreciate your guys' prompt confirmation or receipt when we sent you guys the letter. Um, it's always good to have. Um, and it relates to the city's pedestrian system dedication requirements um, that are currently in I guess they apply in the downtown area. They apply in the overlake zones as well. Um, we have grave concerns about uh, the requirements as they stand in the code and also the notion that they might be extended to other zones in the city as well. And I won't really belabor the legal analysis that we provided in the letter. But in general, where you've got a requirement that a real property interest, such as a pedestrian easement, be exacted from a developer, um, usually you need to tailor those requirements to some sort of impact of a specific development project. And we think that, and we outline this in the letter, but we think the current code doesn't really comport with that legal requirement. What the code has now is just a map of pedestrian pathways for each of these areas. And it's not really tied into what type of development might happen in either area. Um, the other, I think, more problematic piece of the requirement is developers basically have to design their whole project if they want to request a change to a location of one of those pedestrian pathways or if they want to ask for an exemption. Um, and that creates, uh, puts developers in a really tough spot because it takes many months and often several hundreds of thousands of dollars to design your project to a point where you can even show where your pedestrian access points are. Um, so it kind of puts developers in the untenable position of, you know, I can gamble on an exemption which may not be approved, and if it's not approved, the design gets scrapped and we're back to the drawing board or we can design around these kind of, you know, the pedestrian pathways that are shown in the code. And really the result of this is developers are losing a lot of units um, that could be located in those pedestrian pathways. They're losing flexibility. And ultimately the city is losing housing units that, you know, could help it comply with its GMA mandate to allow more dense housing in the city. 
Um, so we totally understand and agree with the need for good design and also pedestrian facilities. That's not really the issue. We just think the way the code is set up now, it puts developers in a catch-22 position. You know, they've got to blow a bunch of money proposing alternates, which may not be approved, or lose units. Um, so that's really what, what we'd like to urge the Planning Commission to reassess for the downtown and overlake zones, and especially if it's applied to any other zones. Um, I think you guys should, um, of course, consult with legal counsel at the city and, and think hard about a process that might be more accessible to developers, possibly earlier in the process and more fair, and of course, something that's more in line with, with legal requirements. Um, and I think we've had these discussions with the city in the past, and um, you know, even if the city thinks it can set the program up in this way, you know, we just don't think it really comports with the, the, the ethical standards that should apply to, you know, the people who make rules for developers. So um, I'm happy to answer questions if the commission has any. I'm also happy to engage further with city staff or the city's legal counsel on this. But really, we just wanted to, you know, remind you all that we'd really urge you to, to reassess this program because it's putting, you know, Nelson Legacy Group and other local developers in a really tough spot. Thanks. Okay, thank you, appreciate yeah. it. Okay, so uh, now we'll move on to the Redmond Zoning Code rewrite and Redmond 2050 Overlake Code updates briefing. And that's uh, Kim and Becky. Oh, before we start that, I'm going to, to stop just one second and acknowledge the uh, staff members who are with us on, in the meeting and on the call tonight. Uh, extending their workday and joining us tonight are Kim Dietz, Becky Fry, Serafie Allen, Odra Cardenas, Chris Wyatt, and Glenn Coyle. And with that, I'll hand it over to Kim and, and Becky. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, I, my camera looks like it is not working tonight, so I apologize for that. But we have uh, Kim and I are going to be joined at the hip for code updates for the next year or so. Um, and so tonight is the first night where we're going to be walking through uh, why that is the case. And we're going to be sharing with you the packages that are coming. So the first thing that we'll be looking at is what are the packages and the timing for those packages. And then I have a couple of quick updates on Overlake um, and what's next and what to expect. So, um, for the code packages, one of the things that we thought might be helpful is to just re-explain, especially for the new planning commissioners, everything that's actually in the comprehensive plan and the fact that we're going through two different phases and how that impacts the code updates. Um, so just as a, a reminder for those who have been around for a while, but an introduction for those who haven't necessarily seen this slide deck before, um, phase one of Redmond 2050 are the things that we're trying to get done first. So uh, the urban centers policies and the overlay code. Um, we're looking at housing and transportation, economic vitality, and the park starts and cultural element. There's also a couple of miscellaneous pieces that are moving forward with that, but those are the first set of policies and code updates that are going to be coming first. After that, um, you'll start to see some of that early work on policies this year for all of the phase two work, and but we won't get to adoption on any of the phase two work until next year. So our land use element, uh, natural environment, shorelines, uh, capital facilities, human services, all of those pieces are technically part of phase two of Redmond uh, 2050. So all of the code updates that are related to those pieces um, are not anticipated to go this year. Again, they'll be adopted next year. And so one of the things that Kim and I have been working out is some of the Redmond Zoning Code work that she was anticipating to get done this year um, could be packaged with or impacted by some of the Redmond 2050 land use updates in particular um, that are planning for next year. So we've worked out 
the packages that you'll see tonight based on if we did something this year, but we'd undo it next year, let's not do it this year unless we absolutely have to. Uh, so that's one of our guiding principles. And then the other, as you might recall from when we last talked about this, is we're just trying to open up a chapter once if we can. I mean, a legislative update or something that we just can't work around might happen, but what we're trying to do is, is just open up a chapter once. But and again, as a reminder, the phase one packages, we're trying to get through this year. Uh, we're starting those public hearings really quickly. Uh, we're gonna try to get those done by November. Um, but there are a couple pieces that will go into early next year, uh, including the transportation element and code updates. And then the phase two packages are all going to be um, next fall of next year. So we're going to start with what's coming this year. And some of the first pieces that you'll see are the housing element update and the code updates related to housing um, that Redmond Zoning could rewrite. So Kim's going to jump in really quick and give a high level update of what those are. Thank you, Becky. Um, you can see on the lower part of the second column, residential typology updates, and these have been being worked on for um, about a year and a half now. I mention that because legislation at the state level has also recently been um, approved. And so that creates um, a significant impact on some of the work we've done. And so you're going to see some of the amendments, but you may not see all of them because they need to be reworked in order to incorporate newer legislation. Some of these are pretty basic. Um, small lot short plats is a basic thing where we're trying to consolidate the code as much as is, is possible into logical chapters. But you may be also familiar with accessory dwelling units that has recently had some legislative updates. And so that is an example of one that we're going to need to take back to the drawing table before bringing it forward. Um, so what you're going to see in the code are uh, a combination of Revin 2050 work, the rewrite work, um, and some legislative amendments. And we've color coded them so that you can, at the very least, be able to track them back to what is necessary from a Revin 2050 perspective for policy, and then what um, has been worked on at the code level. Oftentimes, code is being amended to to clean something up, make it correct, bring it into consistency with an update, or in some cases, it's also related to priority projects at the city level. Okay, next slide, Becky. Uh, before we jump to the next slide, just wanna let folks who are following along, we're gonna start study sessions before a public hearing for this cycle. This is the change from how we normally do it. So in the past, we have done the public hearing first, followed by a series of study sessions. Because these packages can be large, what we are doing this year is starting the study sessions. We'll have one or two study sessions, then the public hearing. We'll continue the discussion to get to a planning commission recommendation after that. Um, the study sessions and the planning commission recommendations that you'll see on these slides are tentative. It just depends on how much time the planning commission needs to get to a recommendation. Uh, but the goal here is to start your study sessions on housing related updates in July. So the next package is Overlake and Overlake related code updates. Um, from a policy standpoint, this is the center's policies. Um, we are updating the urban centers chapter, but not related to downtown. So again, we're only bringing part of a chapter forward. Um, so we're bringing in the centers related policies that affect all centers and then the overlake policies. Uh, but there are a significant number of code updates to that. And I did not overwhelm the slide with all of the code updates going to Redmond 2050 because uh, we have a lot of <laughs> a huge slide deck for that just alone. But just to say that there's a lot moving forward under the Redmond 2050 code updates for overlake. And Kim can jump in and mm -hmm. talk about the zoning code rewrite. Yes, thank you. Everything in the code um, needs to be clear and concise, and that includes definitions. So we're always trying to improve the definitions. One thing about the code is that it is a living document. So it's always going to be changing, and even a change can bring forth other changes. So we try to stay on top of those. Um, so you'll find a lot of definitions that will be included in the package. Limited uses is something that we apply at the allowed use level. So some of the amendments you're going to see are related to economic development and making sure that the code is clear 
exposure to our business community, to our staff who are applying that at the business licensing level, and then to uh, folks such as maybe even our code enforcement officers who need to check in um, later after the business is operating and make sure that they're operating in conformance with the code. Um, the next item is public art. And uh, public art is an interesting one. We're bringing forward something that simply needs to be codified. This has been a program that allows developers as well as anyone interested to apply art um, onto their building. Uh, public art for developers is oftentimes a requirement or part of an incentive package. Interestingly, the code did not have a definition for what it was, nor did we have an exact process for someone to go through. But our Parks and Arts Commission did identify a process and did get a blessing from our city council to apply that process. So what we're bringing forth is that process for codification. It's a very exciting opportunity because it'll bring a lot of clarity to what the city can do, what the Arts Commission can do, and what developers can do as well. Becky is going to be talking about a lot of incentives in Overlake and green building is one of those. That is something that we worked on as a city priority in order to make sure that buildings are long lasting, sustainable and good for the environment. So we have a very significant update to green building. Equally solid waste is something that came from the state level and requires that multifamily, mixed use and commercial in their downtown for example in Overlake have a space to manage composting. So you have waste, uh, garbage, you have recycling, and now we will also have composting that is going to be managed through our waste management contract. So there needs to be space provided for that in development. Um, you'll also see some parking updates. Parking is one of those items that you're going to see a little bit later. Um, that's going to need a little bit additional work, and Jeff Churchill will be bringing that to you later um, in this series. But it is also important for Overlake. So you'll see some of those coming forward. And then finally, we do have two pieces that we need to hold back, and that is landscaping and open space. These are reliant on some work that is happening with the park plan update, as well as a work program that is being managed by our parks maintenance and operations staff, looking at resiliency of landscaping as applied throughout the city. So we wanna take the time with those and make sure that a code amendment is consistent with policies that are being represented in the park plan, but then also those operational standards that our park staff um, will be developing. Becky, do you want to continue? Yeah, one of the things I do want to point out before we move on is this is the one package that might confuse folks because it doesn't necessarily on the surface look like it all relates to each other. However, one of the things that we're trying to do again is we're going to try to open the chapter just once. Um, and we need to make sure that all of the code is in support of the changes that we need to make an overlay. And that is why you'll see what is listed here from the zoning code rewrite. Every single piece of those changes is either directly editing a chapter that we need to update anyway for overlay or it is implementing an urban standard in conjunction with or in support of or in otherwise just uh, parallel to some other changes that we're making to implement um, the updates for Overlake. So from when you start to get the code packages themselves, you're going to see that it does make sense. Um, you'll see a, the definitions chapter. You're going to have code updates that are going to be in red that are coming from the zoning code rewrite, and you'll see code updates in blue, and you'll see them coming from Overlake and the Redmond 2050 process. So all of these, you're going to start to see multiple co color codes in each of these packages. So it's directly related to just trying not to edit a chapter twice. Um, we're going to be bringing forward the center's policies here pretty quickly. Um, here on June 14th, we're going to be bringing back um, the next draft of those policies and moving them forward. And then we're going to be diving deep into the code packages in July. Okay. 
So the next package is transportation. Transportation is a phase one item, but it is going to have to go a slightly different schedule because some changes that have been happening with the schedule for the transportation master plan update. So there's some work that needs to be done there that needs to be complete before we can actually move forward with the transportation policies and code updates. Uh, but there are a significant number of changes and enhancements that we're doing and moving forward with multimodal transportation, moving forward with uh, health and safety improvements, um, accessibility improvements, et cetera. Kim? Um, I think the only thing I need to add is that we are incorporating some standards. You can see those described in tree wells. Um, and it's important for our code not only to represent policy, but then also to represent the standards that the city employs during development of, uh, well, private development, but also development of capital projects. Becky? And for those of you who might be wondering why temporary construction dewatering is a part of this package is because it's directly related to parking. And so because it is directly related to parking, it is put in with the transportation code updates. Um, you will see some information later this year, but you will be going into study session for these changes in January of next year. So the next package is where we're starting to see some things that get a little wonky just because we had some things from the zoning code rewrite that were intended to go this year, but if they did, we would basically be undoing them next year. And so we're making some changes here as, as well. Um, in the land use element and the community design element, uh, we're making some pretty significant changes as we look towards the future. We're consolidating zoning districts, and that is one that has been having a significant impact on some of the changes that Kim and her team has been working on. Um, so anything that is land use related that is going to be impacted by our work is going into this package, and it means they will not be adopted this year. It will instead be adopted next year. Kim? Some of those amendments were to our regional retail district, an opportunity to um, improve the, um, well, an opportunity to improve opportunity for <laughs> businesses to locate in this area. And you will know it um, as the area where Fred Meyer's Target Kohl's is. It is designed for large box retail. And one of the things we wanted to create, because we've heard from businesses over the years that the large box is no longer the footprint that businesses are looking for. They're looking for smaller footprint uh, store areas, but also for those that they can combine with others. For example, you might have retail with a gym, or you might have um, a distribution center as part of your business model, but your store, your actual little retail area is much smaller. Um, so to do that, we were looking at removing a limitation that is in the regional retail district that says you need to be 75,000 square feet or greater as far as a single operational um, store. But in um, the work that is planned through the land use element, there's going to be a significant change, a more robust change than just the removal of that. And so that one is going to be held until the additional work is done in the Southeast Redmond neighborhoods. So we're very excited to bring that forward for your consideration. The next one is the Northeast Design District. This is one also in the Southeast Redmond neighborhood. And it includes a few amendments that are related to the school district eventually being located in that area. Um, it is also looking at um, some different ways that somebody can achieve the intent of the NDD2 and NDD3 zones. It has very specific landscaping requirements, setback requirements. Uh, what we were looking at are different ways that a project can speak to those requirements, but not specifically to the actual measurements. There are a variety of ways they can achieve those. So we wanted to make those opportunities. So what Becky is going to do with her team is look at the amendments that we are we were intending to bring forward and make sure that they are incorporated or if not advanced beyond what we originally intended in her new amendments. Becky? So as a sneak peek, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're going from 50 zoning districts to less than 20. 
So if we start making piece by piece edits in individual zoning districts that are going to disappear next year because they're being consolidated with something else or we're going in a different direction, again, it just it didn't really make a lot of sense um, if it could be held back. Uh, the one case where we would do something this year is if it was a legislative mandate and we needed to get it done um, or if there was some other urgent need. And then we would go ahead and, and just incorporate that. Um, all of these policies and code updates are going to be incorporated through drafting in this process for this year. Um, as Kim had mentioned, all of her updates are pretty well drafted anyway. Um, and so we would just be incorporating them in the drafting that is being done under Redmond 2050. And we'll come to you for adoption in 2024. So the remaining package, I'm just going to turn over to Kim. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. This looks like a long list of work. These are minor amendments that we will be bringing forward. They are either to improve the clarity of the code, um, to incorporate a standard that is being used at the county and the regional level, to incorporate some of the requests we've heard from the community to change the code, and then finally to include legislative changes that were necessary. Just to give an example of a few of those, fats, oil, and grease, or or what we lovingly call FOG. Um, that program has been in place for many, many years. However, King County and several of our neighboring cities have adopted a different approach for dealing with FOG in our um, sewer system. And it will be an improvement to those who are having problems. It's a, a different way of examining the pipes. Um, so we are incorporating that. And by the way, I should point out that that particular one and a few of the other ones in this list are in the Redmond Municipal Code. And so while that is not under the purview of the commission, we are bringing them forward in the package and it gives you an opportunity to see what is being changed. They'll go on to the city council with the rest of the package for their action. Um, another one is beekeeping also in the Rem Municipal Code, and that was a request from a community member to expand the allowance for beekeeping into other zones beyond what it includes today, which would be primarily your single family zones. Uh, they have been trying to include beekeeping on the roofs of multifamily, mixed use, and um, commercial buildings throughout the city to try to spread that opportunity. Um, so this is being proposed consistent with state uh, state requirements for the management of apiaries. Um, marijuana, cannabis, and family daycare. Those are grouped together because they are legislative amendments that we are bringing forward. Um, Interestingly, they are located in the same chapter of our code. Uh, so what we are bringing forward for marijuana cannabis is simply a terminology change. At the state level, the, the name is now cannabis to reflect the scientific name. So we need to incorporate that into our code. You're going to see that almost throughout the entire code when it comes to, to land uses and then when it comes to definition and, and business. Um, then you'll also see daycare provisions. This one is representing a waiver that is now available to daycares in response to a shortage of accessibility but also affordability. Daycares can obtain a waiver to have additional children as long as they meet health and safety and life, life safety as well as building codes. They are allowed to expand their operations to include additional children. However, our code does not allow that at this time. So we are proposing some amendments that will allow the waivers to be processed, give the owners a clear path forward, but also still maintain that requirement for life safety and health. Um, some of the others are truly, truly very, very simple. We like to make sure that we have a consistent approach for uh, cross-referencing throughout the code. We also like to use common terminology. Some of the terminology changes you'll see are reflecting respect, diversity, equi equity, and inclusion priorities. To help you when you're navigating these code amendments, because there are many, many pages that Becky and I will be bringing to you, at the top of each chapter, we try to give you a general summary of what is included within that chapter. And then for each amendment that we are making in the chapter, we have a little bubble to include a comment as to the source of that. So if it is for respect, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we call that out. If it is simply a correction for um, accuracy, we also call that out. We try to give you enough information so you understand the source of the change. Back to you, Becky. Okay. 
Um, that is the last of our packages. So I'd like to pause here in case any of you have any questions for us before we move on. Commissioner Weston. Um, so for the land use, does that include the Southeast um, industrial? Yes. Area? Because I didn't see that one listed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll actually be a part of the Redmond 2050 code updates. Um, we tailored this slide for the folks who are um, following Kim's packages to try to figure out where it fits into the Redmond 2050 world. Uh, but I'll create a more comprehensive list of code updates that are happening under Redmond 2050 as well. Okay, great. Commissioner Parna. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I had a question for you, Kim. Um, from what I understand, legislation has been passed on the ADUs and so on, and we are going to update the code accordingly. Now, we've had a lot of discussion on ADU and what we would like to see. So is there something that we would, like, let's say there is some part of our discussion which isn't covered by legislation, would that be also put and included into the code or would it just conform and comply with the new uh, law passed at the state level? I think uh, what Becky and I will need to do is look back at what you have expressed for ADUs and see if there is an opportunity to include that. In some cases, we are very limited to what can be included. For example, design standards, height, floor area, setbacks. There are limitations. And when we bring that item forward to you, we will be pointing those out. So Becky and I will work together to make sure that we don't miss anything that's already been discussed, but also bringing forward those things that we need to per legislation. Thanks, Kim. And, and uh, oh, sorry, Becky, go ahead. I do want to add that you, you do have study sessions before the public hearing. Okay. So that will give us an opportunity if, if we need to, to adjust anything um, with keeping in mind that we do have all of the, the SEPA environmental review documentation process too. So um, hopefully we'll be able to incorporate everything, but there is this annual review process. So if we can't get it in, in this slice, uh, right. we have a, code updates going next year, a ton of them, right? So, I mean, there there are other opportunities too. So th it's never going to be a, a once and you're done situation. Thank you. And a, uh, and a parallel question to you, Becky, would be that uh, the uh, consultant, I don't know who the name is, but for the overlay incentive package and so mm -hmm. on, would that report be available before the Overlake stuff comes on? Yes, um, we okay. are going to be getting a report from them sometime. I'm not sure what the exact schedule is, um, but we're going to be getting that from them next month with the preliminary concepts. Um, and so our hope is to get all of that to you before we bring a final version of everything for your review for approval or recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Sheffern. Thank you. And I just had a real quick question when we're talking about residential typologies. If you could, um, when we talk about attached dwelling units, are, we, are you guys also talking about detached or day dues? I just wasn't sure since I didn't see it on the list that that was also being considered. Um, the accessory dwelling units is attached as well as detached. Okay, I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can be clear. internal, okay. it can be attached, it can be detached. There are a variety of ways that accessory dwelling units can be provided. Okay. And okay. attached dwelling units could be a duplex or a triplex or a fourplex. An ADU, accessory dwelling unit, it's the same acronym. So just keep in mind, if you see an ADU, make sure <laughs> it's accessory dwelling units or attached dwelling units, they do mean different things. Yeah, and I'm familiar with the city of Seattle standards, <clears throat> which are very, they, they make quite the distinction. So that's why I just was seeking mm -hmm. some clarity. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Van Nyman. This is probably more specific than the type of highlighted materials we're being presented with here on timelines. But when we're talking about these ADUs and the legislation that was passed, how does that 
I, I read an article about it with the Seattle tree canopy uh, vote that they had, that there's some concern that these, these will be in conflict with each other. Um, that, that the tree canopy can't be protected when you go and cut down everybody's trees in their backyard because they're putting in ADUs. Um, does the process for applying for an ADU take into account trees? When an application is taken in, we do have a 35% tree retention right now. And we are also looking at um, amendments to our tree code. And that will be something that hopefully will be coming forward in the near term. Um, so it all it all fits together. It all needs to fit together. Um, so that retention as well as affordable housing and um, availability of housing will need to be balanced. Mm -hmm. There are a number of things with the new legislation um, that even though it might be allowed under legislation, the actual lot conditions might not allow it. Like the legislation says you can have up to two ADUs on any lot but the lot physically might not support that. Um, so it's the same case as in other s criteria as well. It might be allowed, but there's other legislation or regulations uh, adopted at the city level that will have to be worked around and that might make, in some cases, the practicality of implementing um, an ADU on a specific parcel, it may or may not work, or you might get one and not two, et cetera. Any more questions? Okay. Let's okay. Move Let's move on to Overlake. There we go. A couple of things for you. We have a preferred alternative. Uh, so we're working on the materials for that, and we'll come back to you and share that with you. But the big thing for Overlake is now we know how much we're putting in Overlake. <laughs> so we can actually get down to the development regulations. Um, but the preferred alternative is putting 10,000 housing units and about 15,000 jobs in Overlake. And so we're adjusting the floor area ratio of building heights to accommodate that level of growth. Um, there are some finer details that we're still working out. We have a couple of meetings um, this week, including our technical advisor our committee meeting on Friday, um, and we'll look at finalizing some of the last bits and pieces. But for those who have been holding their breath, waiting to see what our floor error ratio adjustments are going to be, um, here they are. <laughs> so um, as you can see, what we're doing is having a significant impact. We're putting a lot of growth in Overlake. We knew that. Um, but as we start to look at the specific numbers and what we're trying to do, uh, for those of you who are not as familiar, when you see base, it means without the incentive program. So this is what's allowed by right without using the incentive program. And then the max then would be what you can get through the incentive program. And so you can see the proposed base is actually really close to our current max for Overlake Village, and you can see our proposed base for OBAT, or Overlake Business Advanced Technology, is more than double uh, what we're looking at currently in Overlake uh, at OBAT. Um, it's not a direct comparison for our new zoning district because we've got three different zoning districts in this new area for that's going to be the Overlake multifamily. Um, but we're going from up to 30 dwelling units per acre to a 3.7 FAR, which is uh, the same FAR that we're looking at in OBAP. The proposed max that we're looking at is no FAR. So if you get your maximum bonus points through the incentive program and you're within the transit-oriented development focus area. We've mentioned this a couple of times previously. What we're moving forward with, there will be no FAR restriction. Keep in mind, there are other restrictions in play, but we're not going to have an FAR restriction. So for building height, we're also seeing some pretty significant changes as we look to go taller. Um, we're going from a base of five stories to a base of eight to 14 stories. In Overlake Village, in um, OBAT, we're looking at a base of four to nine stories that maxed out at just one extra story to, again, that eight to 14. And then in Overlake Multifamily, we're looking at going from three stories to eight stories. Um, 
and we're also proposing a minimum. So again, we have, oops, sorry, apologize. Didn't mean to click. Uh, we have a report that we're going to have to be doing in five years that shows this is the growth that we were assigned and this is what we're seeing it come in for development and it's got to be on par. We have to be getting pretty close to meeting our need and not be severely under meeting our need. And since we have a significant amount of growth going into Overlake, we're proposing a minimum building height um, in Overlake. And what we're doing for the max that you can get with the incentive program is 240 feet. That is approximately 20, it might be 25, depends on if it's residential or business, how tall the ceiling height is for each floor. Um, but 240 feet is around that 20 plus stories in height. Uh, this would only be in the TOD focus areas. Um, and all other, a bunch of other restrictions would apply, but what we're using is in compliance with what we studied under the draft environmental impact statement, and it's also a threshold under the building code. So if you go above 240 feet, you get into another layer of code, and so we're using that as our proposed max. And so those two slides are some things that our development community has been waiting with bated breath for. So we're glad to be able to share that and get that out with the community. Becky, we have a question. Commissioner West. Yes. Hi. Um, so can we back up just a second to the floor area sure. ratios? What do those actually mean or how are they calculated? That's a very good question. I think what I will have to do is I'll have to send you some material in um, your email so you can see because there's the diagrams help. But essentially a one-to-one -one ratio, so like a, an FAR of one, would be your entire building floor, or your square footage on that first floor. And then your FAR of two would double that, right? So you'd get that extra story. Um, and then like a 0.5 would be, you know, you've got a half of that on the, the ground. And that's really hard to explain without illustration. So... Is it, uh, but sort of, it, it talks about sorry. square footage. It's all about square footage. Is it sort of like um, the number of units per floor, or is that not the right way to think about it? No, it's units the per total, floor. It's the total floor area of all yeah. the, the areas yep. uh, divided by the area of the plot. Yeah. Oh. So, okay. yeah, it's it's the, the square, okay. it's... If you look at a ratio yes. and it's the total building square feet is on one side of the ratio mark and on the other half the is size. the total square, buildable square footage of the lot. Yeah. Okay. So you're talking about lot coverage. It's not exactly mm. lot coverage. Okay. Because it can, you, you know, you can accomplish it in different ways. Wikipedia has oh, a... Oh, right. Wikipedia has a thing, uh, actually a diagram that, that compares... Lot coverage. Madam Chair. FAR. <laughs> Madam <laughs> Chair. Thank you very much. Sherry. Yeah. I, I might be able to help with that. Yeah. Um, okay. One of the ways that we've thought about it in the past is that um, Be Becky mentioned it is related to, say, you have a one, FAR of one that's related to your first floor. But imagine that first floor being the entirety of your lot. So that would be a one. Now, it doesn't mean you have to develop it as the entirety of the lot. You could take half of it and put it on top. You're still at one, but it's the equivalent of one full lot being covered. Yes. And then two would be cover it twice and increase it up from there. So it's, it's the yeah. amount of building, but it's based on the lot, yeah. based on the size of the lot. So if you have a ratio of five, you're mm -hmm. saying, five times the size of the lot. Yes. yes. Somehow mm -hmm. stacked somehow, vertically. Somehow yeah, stacked however exactly. you... Perfect. But you don't yes. have to use the... You know, what the lot coverage is depends... You could use half the lot and have more stories. Yeah. If maybe. Depending yes. on maybe. Exactly. Yeah. There we okay. go. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so we did get there without a diagram. <laughs> Thank you for your assistance. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Denny. Um, and I just uploaded a link if it might help that shows an illustration in the chat. So, um, because I think it is confusing until we get some sort of visual. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah that was, uh, Denny just uploaded the link in the chat that I was just 
talking about on Wikipedia. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank yeah, you. It's got a perfect Hopefully little diagram of the comparison yeah. between FAR and lot coverage. Uh, Commissioner Aparna. Yeah, added to that is also the discussion that sometimes there will be setbacks and things where you can't build on the lot. Right. But that means you like if you want to go above one, then you would be going higher. That's an assumption, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Becky, I had a question. So, let's say we've got this um, this FAR, uh, which is worked out, and does that mean that all the back end calculations of things like water and sewage have also been taken into account? Um, if I do a three point seven or a five FAR on a, a a lot which is commercial versus residential obviously the water usage is different right yeah so have we taken into account let's say max water usage of you know all residential at far5 is that We're already in taken into account or would we be working backwards when the developers come in and say hey here's what we want to build and then you work on the calculations so what we are doing with the preferred alternative is we're actually going to mo and through modeling at the max level. Okay. Um, and so for water and sewer, we're modeling it at the max. And we very, very rarely get a development coming in at the maximum um, just because, mm -hmm. you know, the site preferences or requirements all, right. you know, tend to impact a development. Um, but from a modeling standpoint, so we can understand the usages and need requirements for that, uh, it, we're modeling it at full. Does that help? Oh, yeah, so you're also modeling it at full and maximum usage, correct? Yes. Like for water. Okay, that's mm -hmm. all I wanted to know. Thank you. Yeah, and we have already started the modeling for transportation. We've got a few little bits and pieces for water and sewer to finalize, but we're going to be beginning modeling on that here within a week or so. But yeah. Thanks. Any other question on these two? Looks like we're good to go. Okay. Um, the other piece that has been outstanding that folks have been waiting for are the streets and the public realm standards. And so wanted to let you know, we're getting really close to getting that finalized. Um, the Overlake Village map, this is I believe the map we're moving forward with in the draft for your review, uh, the OBAT map is coming in a couple of weeks. Um, they're getting pretty close, but this, the standards here are um, going to be apply to Overlake Village and OBAT because we're going to be using the same street topology in that transit oriented development focus area in OBAT. Um, so the numbers will apply. Keeping in mind for folks that in OBAT, in that transit oriented development focus area, we're seeing major changes because we're going from campus style development to transit oriented development with buildings up against the street. So it's a completely different change. The standards are different. Um, so there will be a different look and feel for those areas near the light rail station that happen to be in that zoning district. Um, then a couple of other things, uh, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, the landscaping and open space are on hold. So the package for Overlake is going to be including what's currently required for Overlake related to landscaping and open space. But next year, when the landscaping and open space requirements are complete and we're updating all of the standards for all the centers, then it, those changes are going to impact Overlake. Um, so there's going to be a little bit of a lag in the open space and landscaping and people should expect that there will be open spacing landscaping updates that will impact Overlake. But because of the timing of the work that needs to be done for that, we're not gonna change the requirements for Overlake today because we don't wanna guess what the future is going to be on that. We're gonna go ahead and let that process complete and then just adopt the final standards as they need to be for everybody for consistency, number one. Um, but also because the park plan still needs to get adopted, it's um, including some new open space topologies. There's just a lot of work that needs to be finalized for that. Um, the draft incentive package, uh, we mentioned a little bit earlier, that is still ongoing. We'll come back to you. The streets is getting really, really close, um, and we'll get that back to you as well. Uh, what we would like to ask is that you set some 
time aside in June because we're going to be publishing a package of Overlake that does not include these pieces that are still, we'll have a note that says this piece is moving forward, but we would like you to start reading through what's being proposed because it is a rather large package um, and we want to get it to you as early as we can um, and give you some time to look at it. So we'd like to ask that you just set aside some time in June, a couple hours here and there, uh, just to get a little bit familiar with it. Um, what we would like to do is provide you with a bunch of tools to navigate that. We're going to have the, the simple to read chart of all the changes, you know, in a tab table format. So you can see this is a big change, a little change. I'm OK. I can pin in a one or two things that I really want to go look at first. Um, and we want to provide you with a clean version and then. Um, the red line version if you want it, but keeping in mind that there's going to be like 150 pages of strike through um, in 2112. So just keep in mind, you might not want to start with strike through version, uh, but we'll provide you with some instructions that with some helpful ways to navigate getting through the package. So um, if there are any other questions that wraps up our briefing for you today. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I have one question on the street cross section updates. Mm -hmm. um, is this related to uh, the topic that we heard about from Mr. Graham tonight in the public comment? No, that okay. is actually a separate conversation. Okay. Okay. Good question. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, Redmond 2050 monthly update. Uh, Seraphie is going to do that. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Uh, so for the monthly update, we thought it would be helpful to go uh, over some of the events we're kicking off uh, the season. So just, uh, I know some of you uh, stopped by the Cinco de Mayo booth that they had, but we had over um, 300 people stop by and provide us feedback. Um, Glenn and I can attest to part of that was that we gave out some t-shirts and got mobbed <laughs> for a quick second. We're going to have a better strategy for derby days <laughs> is what we decided. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we got some really great um, engagement there. And as a reminder, all of this is in your packet if you want some more uh, detail for what kind of feedback that we got. Um, and then just wanted to provide you a preview of what is to come. And hopefully some of you might be able to make uh, the pint with a planner tomorrow at um, where are we having it tomorrow? Glenn? At postdoc tomorrow. <laughs> of course. So of course. I think I saw Angie there last time. <laughs> last one. All right. It's postdoc in uh, Marymore. Marymore Village, yeah. Yes. Okay. Near yep. Whole Foods. Uh, and then go ahead and go to the next item, Glenn. And then uh, some of you may have been tracking. Again, more details are in uh, your packet if you're interested, but just wanted to remind you all that we'll be incorporating a lot of legislation that was adopted this year and from uh, the prior session with House Bill um, 1220. Um, but yeah, so if anyone had any questions about any of those, happy to uh, talk about it. But let me check. Um, yeah, and then the, um, for further updates, uh, we don't have a slide for this, but uh, Becky also went over this a little bit, but the first draft of the participation implementation and evaluation policies are being reviewed by the advisory committee um, and will be coming to you all later in June. And then the first drafts for utilities, capital facilities, and the natural environment policies are ready for publication and will be on your agenda in June. And then the first draft of the residential and non-residential land use policies will be published in June and will be on your agenda for July. And then the uh, additional environmental analysis is underway um, and the draft EIS is expected for September. So we have a bit of a busy summer, both on the events side and the policy paperwork end. So appreciate your excitement about <laughs> about it. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. 
so what are the specific topics that you're covering at the different events throughout? Is it always the same? Or are you asking different questions? Great question. Uh, so there we do actually have a couple different ones. Glenn, if you want to go back to that other slide and I can go more in depth. So um, for the Southeast Redmond Stakeholder wor Workshop will be focused on the uh, two new countywide centers, so focused on Mary Moore Village um, as a growth center and then focused on the industrial growth center in Southeast that we've proposed. Um, so that will be the focus of that topic. Actually going back up uh, for the 30, for the some of the June events, the complete neighborhoods workshops will be focused a lot in schools. Actually, there was just a workshop this week that was focused on schools. You'll get an idea uh, for your next agenda item of how we're engaging people in a different way more through activities, because we're going to have you all try it uh, with this game. But um, that is focused on the complete neighborhoods and having to prioritize and choose what kind of, uh, you know, tools or facilities do you want in your your neighborhood. Um, so yeah, Complete Neighborhoods, Mary Moore Village and Southeast Redmond, and then just more of the monthly pop-up engagement opportunities about overall uh, work, such as uh, the Pint with a Planner and some of the other ones. Well, we also have a few more things that we're gonna be scheduling, like I'll be scheduling another overlay of um, engagement for stakeholders once we get the final package ready for the code, right? Um, and then we're gonna have some downtown changes that are moving forward. So some downtown specific engagement events will be held. And we've got a number of other pop-ups that we're gonna be uh, adding to the calendar. Uh, so our Get Involved page on Redmond 2050 has everything that you see here today, plus a few other things. And I would just recommend that you encourage people to follow that uh, because we will be scheduling more things as we can continue through this wild and crazy summer. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. And that actually reminded me that you all might remember that we started a, did a community engagement contract with Eastside for All, which also has a number of subrecipients. And we just met with them yesterday to discuss uh, which events would they want to incorporate and then which maybe events do they want to um, have us invite us to to help co-facilitate. So there'll actually be more events that'll pop up on the calendar. Mm -hmm. But I uh, just wanted to give you a slice. Quick question, um, is the rocking on the river, is, does that coincide with the Planning Commission meeting on the August 9th? If I recall from last year, it did at times. Yep. Okay, darn. There, there are a number of different rocking on the river days, so we may do more than one. Great, thank you. Yeah, maybe on a non-planning commission day. I do remember last year coming in and being like, oh, that looks so nice out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think nice last year we yeah. did two Rockin' on the Rivers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a great event last year, so um, yeah. I'm all in favor. Yeah. Commissioner Weston. Do you want, if we're able to attend some of these, do you want us to let you know ahead of time so we don't? That would be great, just just so we know, too, it also helps because you all also have a lot of knowledge being on the planning commission, so it helps us to know, um, you know, have a good diversity of staff um, that's available, but maybe also be like, hey, you want to help out by talking to some community members? We'd really appreciate it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I accidentally attended one of the library pop-ups um, okay. with my kids last week. <laughs> nice. They really liked it. <laughs> Good. No, uh, you are definitely welcome to attend. Uh, we just need to keep track and make sure that there's no quorum. That's all. Yeah. Thanks for the reminder, Becky. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any. Okay. Thanks, Seraphie. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to try something new and different. Uh, we're going Our. to try an activity, Redmondscape's game, Complete Neighborhoods Engagement Tool. Uh, Becky, you want to kick us off? Yeah, so I've got a couple of slides just to set the stage. And so especially for folks who are following along that might not be as familiar with the concept. But um, <laughs> yeah, we correct. were... We were looking at ways to engage folks at a level that they understand that's not really super technical. Uh, that was 
incorporating some gamification, right? So something fun to do and, and play with, but in a way that really allowed us to get insight onto what the community's priorities might be or things that they might be happy to see in our community. Um, and so what we did is we took inspiration from a game called Kuwaitscapes, which was developed, I believe, uh, from the London School of Economy for engagement actually in Kuwait. And under the Creative Commons license, we made some adjustments and tuned it to Redmond. Um, and we were focusing really on our complete neighborhoods because that is the conversation we're having this summer. So we tuned the game to this conversation about complete neighborhoods. And for those, again, who haven't been following along or might not be familiar with that, that means is making sure that we have a neighborhood where essentially most of what the things that you need in your daily life are within a comfortable walking distance. Um, and so a lot of folks are familiar with the 10 minute community or 15 minute community. Um, we've had a lot of feedback from our disabled community member and our, and our senior community members that that really means something completely different for them. And so we need to keep in mind that everybody's got a different distance and speed and mode of transportation. Uh, so we're looking at complete neighborhoods, complete communities. And the three things that we're really focusing on with a lot of our engagement that you see us moving forward are these here. Uh, not included on this slide are the updates that we're going to be looking to do to our home-based businesses to expand what's currently allowed um, and maybe loosen up some regulations related to our existing home occupation permitting process. Um, these three are new and different and beyond that. Uh, so we're looking at repurposing homes, micro or mini uh, solutions like food trucks and commercial structures. So um, like the micro and mini, the food trucks, those are all temporary, transient. They don't actually impact the neighborhood at all. A repurposing the home has minimal impacts. There might be signage, you might be some parking requirements, but the building itself will be a substantially the change and it may go back and forth. Like it might be a restaurant for a couple of years and then go back to being a residential unit and back and forth. But again, that might be semi-permanent. Um, the commercial cluster idea might be taking and rezoning a corner or a strip um, and allowing it to demolish an existing house and redevelopment with a commercial building or a mixed-use building. So we're engaging with the community primarily this summer on these different activities um, and we folded this into the game but the game goes a little bit beyond that um, so what we're doing is we take and you have a game board um, and what we'll ask you to do is and we ask everybody to do is identify the neighborhood uh, some of the game boards are assigned neighborhoods you might get downtown and Mary Moore or you pick your neighborhood um, you get a set of character cards there is a whole number of characters we've renamed some of them with some of our CAC or some of our staff members and we've updated some of their um, descriptions to currently reference what's here in our community uh, like the Redmond Saturday Market or the Redmond High School um, and then we have prompt cards that have goals that for what you're trying to look at and we'll have a whole series of tool cards and each game board would get two randomized character cards and you'd get a full set of tools and then during game play you're given prompt cards that change maybe the decisions that you make on the selection of your tool cards. Um, the intent is to really take and look at each of the tool cards, each of the prompt cards and the character cards and just try to find a balance so that the tools meet the prompts and the character needs but also balance your themes of equity and inclusion, sustainability, resiliency and health and safety. So for the game this evening, what we would like to do is have you pick a neighborhood to work with as um, this evening. So we do not want you to pick a center. We want you to pick one of the neighborhoods. So commissioners, which neighborhood would you like to use for your game board tonight? Do we all pick the same one or is it different? For this evening, just pick one. We'll have one game board for the planning commission game. <laughs> <laughs> I know grass on the okay. best, but. Yeah. Anything except Ed Hill. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. I'm offended. <laughs> Respectfully. Yeah. <laughs> How about Rose so, Hill? Okay. I know very so, little about Rose Hill, but sure. Rose Hill it is. Rose Hill. Okay. So share with the group, those of you who are familiar with Rose Hill, what you know about what's there today and what you know is planned for the future of that area. That's going to be important context because that does not go away unless your tools replace it. So I feel like most of what's useful on Rose Hill is actually on the Kirkland side of 132nd. Um, the Redmond side is very sparse. There's a deep ravine and like gradient. So it's very disconnected from the top of the hill down to the bottom by the Sammamish River. Um, there's growing commercial districts through there. Um, there's been a bunch of new construction down um, along Willows Road. Is Willows part of Rose Hill or is that part of downtown? No, Willows is a separate neighborhood. Okay. You're seeing a little okay. more uh, townhomes, more townhomes yes. in the area. Yeah, tons of new redevelopment on those larger yeah. lots. Yes, a mostly of, okay. still housing though. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. There's very um, iffy, like sidewalk slash trail connectivity. Um, it's really there's some, but it's really not a safe route. It's a major route for school buses and regular buses. A lot of the neighborhood's older, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the infrastructure and like the sidewalks, et cetera, are not up to the same standards as some of the newer construction. And I think okay. there might still be some uh, homes on septic. Yes. Yeah. There are quite a few homes still on septic in the area. Okay. And it, so, it definitely poses um, considerable oops, accessibility challenges when we're talking about that neighborhood. Yep. But yeah. it's interesting because it does have some things that are really useful. Like there's the technical school, the technical college that's mm -hmm. up there. Like Washington yeah, Tech. Lake Washington there we go. Technical Thank you. College. Yeah. Did you build? Yeah. No, uh, the actual technical. Oh, LW Tech. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some so community we'll services, but again, mostly on the Kirkland side. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Becky, when I click on the Redmond neighborhood map from the website, the Redmond website, it shows Willows Rose Hill as one neighborhood. Oh, just we'll saying. have to update that. <laughs> <laughs> just That's saying. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> we have uh, in our planning documents, they're, they're separate, but yeah, that's good to know. And there are a few okay. little parks, but they're very hard to get to. There might be a neighborhood playground here and there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that's your context. All right. For the sake of speeding through things, I'm going to give you your first prompt card right now too, but let's talk about your character cards. The character cards, again, we have a full set. I just randomly chose two um, that had completely different descriptions too. So Khalid is your first character. He's an aerospace engineer. He uses a wheelchair. He likes to eat out, go to community events, and he participates in adaptive sports. Um, your second character is Melody. She's an artist with a booth at the Redmond Saturday Market. She loves to go visit the local wineries, breweries, and community festivals. So those are your two characters to keep in mind. Then your first prompt card would be, what changes would you bring to your neighborhood? So Rose Hill, to improve access to shops and services near where people live. And so your hint on that is to look for tools with sustainability and resiliency benefits. Okay. All right, so I, in person, <laughs> we would then put the character cards down and your pump cards. And then what we will do is look at the tool cards. So the first thing to keep in mind is you only can choose six tools. You've got a whole bunch more than that to choose from, but every community has budget and resource constraints, so you have to limit it to just six. Keep in mind your character, your prompt card, and the benefits from each card, and also wanted to let you know if you don't see the tool that you wanted to use, we do have blank tool cards to make your own. So what I'm going to do is turn it over to you guys. I'll have this showing. Um, 
on the screen so you can see all of the different tools. And all of you in front of you should have the tools. Um, and then if, Seraphie, if they haven't been handed out, if you could please the, So the tools out. have been handled out. The one thing is we Thank don't you. have enough character cards for each one of them to have the same character. So just want to let you know, I gave half of you half the characters and half the other just... Actually, you're the only okay. one that has all of them. <laughs> uh, so and just note fine. that. <laughs> for this game set, I saw we've the trading for the Planet <laughs> Commission. <laughs> but so you can see, you can pass each other and see all the different characters if you'd like. But for this gameplay tonight, we're going to choose Colleen and Melody. So I'm going to turn it over to the Planet Commission to discuss amongst yourselves what you would like to use for your six tools. Can you say the prompt one more white time? White sidewalks. Wide sidewalks. Can you say the prompt one more time? Your prompt is what changes would you bring to your neighborhood to improve access to shops and services near to where people live? Wide so sidewalks, is that a tool we can use? Wide sidewalks is one of the tools. You can propose oh, that yeah. as one of the six. To Wayfinding. Wayfinding is a proposal. We only have six, remember? So we can propose a bunch and then may have to uh, cut back. Right. So um, public right. transit. Public transit. Here, we're gonna public transit, this. and I'm trying to find wayfinding in here. Uh, I wanted to propose community festivals since our two people right. both seem to like uh, community events and festivals. <laughs> I was thinking pop-up markets because I don't know if you have the space, but it would be nice to have something which makes that space more vibrant for the people who are there. You were proposing there's nothing there right now. Yeah. You were pop-up markets. This was your proposal. So pop -up yes. Markets, Oops. Uh, did you want community festivals or neighborhood events? Sorry. Well, we're, right now, we're just we're we're brainstorming and yep. and then we'll cut back to six. Okay, so you want both of them right now? Okay. For right now, um, we both of them. Which which one do you want? Which, painted crosswalks. Um, the neighborhood corner store, because right now you either have to go all the way right. down to eighty fifth, and there isn't good okay. like pedestrian, or you have to go up to Totem Lake. Six, seven, eight. Okay, we're up to eight right now. Oh, I was going to propose indoor community spaces because there's nothing there for the people, like local. Which which um, did you want? Indoor community spaces. Indoor community spaces. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's go let's go to no more than ten. So one okay. more and then we'll cut back to six. What do we have We have neighborhood events, community festivals, public transit pop-up markets, wide sidewalks, wayfinded, wayfinding, painted crosswalks, indoor community spaces, and neighborhood corner store. I would say diverse housing types. Diverse housing types. Especially because so much of that is getting redeveloped. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now we're down to nine. We need to get down to six. I would go with either painted or wide sidewalks. So you want either wide sidewalks or painted cross? Yeah. Okay. So between we have between eight and nine, we have to get down Yes. Yes, I agree. Yep. And then I think for neighborhood events, community festivals, oh. and pop-up markets, we should do only one. Right. That's what we were, we were. That that area has almost no parking, so I feel like community festival, like something that's very large, isn't going to work. It would have to okay. be something. Well, let's that's get rid of community smaller. festivals. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Turn on your mics, everybody, so that the people online can can hear you. Yeah. We Did you guys make a decision on crosswalks or wide sidewalks? I couldn't we have hear a decision. We want both. We have. We want both. We're, okay. We're All right. We're going to leave it for um, now. We have the painted crossworks, wide sidewalks, diverse housing types, pop-up markets, neighborhood events, neighborhood corners. Yeah, so we're we're currently at eight. We have to cut down two more. Oh wait, we're at eight. I 
F7. 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 Which, what did we get rid of? So we have crosswalks, wide sidewalks, public transit, diverse housing types, neighborhood corner store, and then pop-up markets and neighborhood events I have in one pile. I had in, indoor community yep, spaces? Yep, here. I did not have that one. Okay. Indoor community spaces is gone. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we, By we fiat. To, Sorry, guys. <laughs> we have to take away one then, right? Yeah. So we need to get... We need to get one. I would propose choosing between neighborhood events and pop-up markets. Yeah. Did we um, get rid of wayfinding already? Yes, we got rid of wayfinding. Okay. I mean, does pop-up markets include food trucks? Yeah, it shows food trucks. Yes. Does that require it could, space? Yeah. And it also yeah, shows like out. selling things, which would <laughs> Melody is the artist with the booth, so. Yeah. Oh right, good point. Pop-up market. So. Relevant to her. Yeah, I like pop-up market. That's so okay, so get rid of neighborhood, 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 events. neighborhood events. Neighborhood events. Okay. Okay. Pop up mark could be Good a neighborhood decision. event. Now we're down to six. Cool. Okay, so here's what we have then for events. So just a quick reminder, we have, go back and forth, grab our characters and... Your prompt was, what changes would you bring to your neighborhood to improve access to shops and services? Do you feel like you're meeting your prompt? Absolutely. Yep, especially for okay. Khalid. Yeah. Okay. And how do you feel you've balanced the benefits and your our themes? Well, on over half of them, we have three benefits per, per solution. So Good. keeping that in mind, okay, mm -hmm. as I'm going to throw your second prompt card. Okay, what changes would you bring to your neighborhood to help residents meet essential needs during a natural disaster where cars are not usable? So it's your second prompt. And would you change anything from your selection to meet that particular goal? I, I wouldn't change anything. I think that we added yeah. public transit, and we have the wide sidewalks and wide wide yeah. cross painted crossworks and the pop up markets. Neighborhood store and the corner store. I actually feel like would be really important yeah. for that because then you actually have a nexus where people are coming, right. and like exchanging, like communicating. Like you have a place they can actually go in the neighborhood. We meet and that pop up need. markets where you could br you know, bring things in. Absolutely, yeah. Becky. If, if cars mm -hmm. are not able to be used, um, then is shipping and supply impacted by that? It can be, yes. So that so means... A community garden. <laughs> your public transit is not you usable. You the community garden overnight. <laughs> I'm sorry, Becky, can you... What'd you say, Becky? Your public transit is not usable with that prompt because your roadways are impacted. So I'm still actually okay with that because it's um, we have the sidewalks. I think. Can you have I'm the houses? Okay so I'm, I'm okay. actually I'm just thinking through because like when I think about the roads being impacted, what I'm really worried about there is bridges, and that's actually one of the few mm -hmm. areas where there aren't major bridges that would tumble in a disaster. Well, if if you can't bring in cars, if you can't use the roads, if you can't bring in cars or public transit then the only methods of transportation you have left are foot right. or bike. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and one of our characters can't use a bike. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so the wide crossworks and wide sidewalks helps. Yeah. Um, but you I could mean, just walk down the center of the street at that yeah. point. <laughs> if there are no cars, you don't need to add protected bike lanes because you're only protecting bike lanes from cars. How are you going to feed your neighborhood? We had to, we had to have thought you, about you, that you, beforehand. You, you're going to have to walk because you can't you're gonna have to walk. plants overnight and you can't grow yeah. plants in the winter. So, um, so you walk to the nearest. You walk, you, you walk and you forage. <laughs> if you can't bring Please? in trucks, you're going to have to go. Yeah, you're going to have to. 
It's the apocalypse. What happened to the rooftop garden? But I don't see any other tools that yeah. are going to allow we, us to. We have the trees community gardens, we have rooftop yeah. amenity spaces. But community gardens are going to take we have parks. months yeah. to grow. And they're not yeah. going to provide really trees? for everyone who's there. It's too no. big a population. You can't, you can't scale a community. So you've got wide yeah. sidewalks for everyone to go walk and forage. <laughs> well, yeah. We can have a Donna party. <laughs> there, there are residents with chickens okay. on Rose Hill. There you go. We're gonna, we're gonna, there are. we're going to. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing. You might have to really <laughs> get to know your neighbors. We're gonna cook all the chickens in right? the backyard. Yeah. Angela has already what got about her eye on trails the to connect to the other trails so we are we are not not connected? Because let's say there's an earthquake or something. Let's say some trails, trees yeah. falls across the trails. They still can be crossed over as opposed to a building in rubble. So a trail, a connected trail system might actually be our way out in a natural disaster yeah, scenario. Yeah, a card here. But how is trail? Would you like to go ahead and move in? that in since you're I, up no, I, I leave it to Sherry and the rest of the group. <laughs> <and follow laughs> really yeah, I mean, does the is Rose Hill are connected to the trail system? Well, now? No. no. no but it's really no. hard with that ravine, to be perfectly honest. So they there, are if you go across to Kirkland. Bridge. No, there is a bridge. bridge. There's bridge. one. Yeah. There, there is a trail that goes from Redmond down to Bellevue on the, the Redmond-Bellevue border down by Bridal Trails. And there's one that goes down 124th, right. so north That's of Rose Hill. So I, it's, uh, you know. That's for kind of side. trail adjacent, but there's not necessarily a lot of trail connections specifically in Rose Hill. Mm -mm. No, but it actually it does. If you're at like, I forget what the cross street is. It would be north of 85th, but like, I don't know. That whole elementary school, there's the series of parks and then the fire station. Mm -hmm. Like up there, right. there's a really good, it's mostly not in Redmond, like most of that neighborhood. But mm -hmm. there's a really good east-west connector. And then several places where that connects down to 85th. 85th is terrible to walk. Like the sidewalks are <laughs> like just scary. They're not Hi. real. But if there are no cars, it's a lot. It, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> they're like tripping hazards and they're narrow and they're but tall. walking on the street if there are no cars. <laughs> yeah. Fair. That's true. Even on 85th, yeah, the I don't think I could do it. Place. Yeah. All right. So in actual gameplay like when we're in the schools and we're doing these in workshops we also have some actions that we do during gameplay so there might be um the mayor comes and vetoes something and you take that card and it's permanently removed from the board you might have budget cuts because of x y and z you can only have four tools instead of six or you had a council turnover and they require at least four of your six tool cards to have you know, maybe pick a pick a theme, health and safety. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have different zinger actions <laughs> that we play during gameplay to change things up and make people think about different ways that they can redesign the neighborhood to meet the needs. But in a nutshell, this is the game. Um, and we have had a lot of fun playing this with um, folks so far, and we hope that over the course of the summer, more folks will join us at our events. And we have another uh, series of events at the middle school and high school that we're planning. We're going to have a copy of the gameplay at the library. And so folks can go and play and submit a copy of the picture of their game to us and enter in for a drawing for a prize and a couple of other ways. But um, when we do it in a group or in a workshop setting, what we do with which each of the different groups would have a speaker and they'd actually share, you know, who their characters are and their prompts and their decisions um, and then how they've balanced the themes. Do they think they've specifically skewed towards or away something in particular um, for and then just kind of explain their reasoning. So, um, but yeah, what do you all think about this particular activity? I'm still invested in the scenario. Can I ask one follow-up question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. So there's the heat wave um, option that was mm -hmm. like as one of the like plot twists. Um, yeah. And one of the things for that would be an indoor space. Mm -hmm. Most of the indoor yeah. spaces in that particular neighborhood, like the schools, are all across the board in Kirkland. Um, like you're talking, 
Rose Hill Elementary, mm -hmm. Rose Hill Middle School, and actually with the new redistricting next fall, a lot of them are further afield, like in Northern Kirkland. Um, Rose Hill Middle is in Redmond. I think so. Um, yes, no, sorry, it's thank in you. in Kirkland, I think. Isn't I it I should know Kirkland? that, it's right by my house, but it's <laughs> mentally in Kirkland it to me. Kirkland. It's right on the line. Yeah. It's um, in Kirkland, I thought. It's actually in, but in any case, does that play into the city's like emergency prep scenarios that like some of those people are going to be better served by like schools that they already know that are not in Redmond? Yeah, we do have an emergency planning preparation process. Um, and so I, our fire department staffs that process. So um, we could, I think, uh, were you around when Patty Jean did the training for planning commission for emergency? No, she prep? wasn't. No. Okay. I think I'm um, the only if, one still around from when we did that. If this planning yeah. commission would be interested in that, we can ask the new staff um, who are doing that. It's fine. Patty Jean's left the yeah. city, but we do have new staff in play. We can bring that staff back to the planning commission. Um, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. A good idea and fun. Okay. Yeah. There, was, it's not always top of mind, ago. but it's it's just really good to know. Yeah, we, did, yeah. we did that a long time ago. I think I'm the only one who. Yeah, who went I through was it. there too. I was there too. Oh, Sherry. okay. A part, yeah, you were. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're Lisa Figueroa. I thought a part I had been there. Is but yeah. the new? Um, she's been here about a year. Uh, uh, staff, and yeah. that's the um, emergency manager. Um, and she's been doing a lot of internal work too. Mm -hmm. So we, I'm, we might check in with her on what would be a good time to yeah. come talk with you all. But also just so you know, planning has been doing their own continuity of operations plan, which I'm leading, which has been really fun <laughs> around emergency stuff. So if you want us to tell you about that, we'll finish up over this summer. Yeah, I always think that's interesting. Yeah. That will be really good. Yeah, we need to know that our city keeps standing, right? And mm -hmm. you guys are going to lead a, lead the way. <laughs> Commissioner Nueva Camina. Uh, Becky, thank you for, for bringing the game. And staff, thank you very much for bringing the game. When I had attended uh, recently Build for All, uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was a lot of fun to be using a different part of our brains and having incorporating play into it so that we are more creative in our, the solutions that, that we bring up. Um, so I, I, I appreciate the game. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay. Any other comments about the game? No, I was going to say, I, I, I echo what Angela said. This game kind of does kind of unsticks my mind so that I can really think in, in, in novel ways how to solve these challenges. So this is fun. This is fun too. Yeah. What they talked about at that training was that the, the, it's the different part of your brain. Mm -hmm. It gets engaged. And, the, and that furthermore, um, if you have highly contentious situations, that moving over to that other part of your brain can really de-escalate things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what we're, we're hoping, too, is that people get a better sense of the fact that they can participate in this process of designing their community, and they can come up with ideas and share their ideas and, and be engaged in a different way that they might not have been familiar with before. Um, and we hope that they just get comfortable with that concept in and of itself so that they're fully engaging in other activities and come and then tell us specifically in my neighborhood, I want to see X, Y, and Z. Right. Commissioner Raparna. I think, I think this is wonderful. I think, is there a separate way to capture all the ideas for the blank cards? Because I think that's where you know, truly completely different ideas are going to come from, right? Yeah, yeah. We've actually, every time we do the event, um, we've been taking all notes of everything that we've been taking actual snapshots of people's boards too. Um, and so we're actually cataloging all the new ideas that have been coming in. And I'm like, you know, hey, I want a bar and nightlife, you know? So I mean, <laughs> or, you know, an aquarium. I'm, there's just all over the place, depending on where we're at, the ideas that have been coming in. Um, but yeah, so we are documenting it all and we'll share this process outcomes with everybody um, as we go along. 
Um, I think, Becky, this this is wonderful, especially if you bring in the resilience piece, because a lot of people look at it as the here and now. But then when you add the resilience piece, I think it gets it's when, you know, when the rubber hits the road, if you will. Right. Um, and uh, I think having classifications of natural disasters might actually help because a, a massive earthquake. I don't think most of our imaginations are going to fall apart at that point, right? <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, let's say it's very poor air quality or a heat wave or something. Um, yeah. You know, it's um, something which impacts to some degree and more often rather than a once in a lifetime thing where we're in the long run, we're dead anyway kind of thing. So, <laughs> um, scaling yeah. the natural disasters might be a really good thing for people to start thinking about resilience. What we have been doing is we have been, we've had a couple of listening sessions as we go and do this too. We are coming up with new prompt cards as we go through the summer. Yeah. And so we'll see and kind of tailor some of the prompt cards a little bit as we continue through this. The other thing that we're looking to do is, um, Oja's helping me translate this into Spanish. And the, we are gonna be customizing the, the Spanish board to things like somebody's looking for an event space to hold a quinceanera. And so we're gonna have customized, um, culturally relevant, options to choose from and needs in the community members and we're going to be looking to see if we can potentially translate it to other languages as well um, so we're definitely going to be doing this in spanish and english and then if we can if we can make it work within our budget and scheduling um, we'll be looking at at least one if not two more languages so. oh. commissioner sheffern thank you um no this was really a lot of fun and it certainly um, kind of creates a lot of potential for some interesting dialogue. And I think the thing that comes to mind for me is, you know, we've when we're talking about Rose Hill, we're also talking about an adjacent jurisdiction. So mm -hmm. I think we're <clears throat> looking at the idea of resilience. We also have, you know, what I would term as interdependent. And so when we're trying to, um, we, I guess we just can't plan in isolation, particularly if we're mm -hmm. talking about scenario that involves natural disasters <clears throat> and so yeah just something maybe That's as true. a tool card or some some way to kind of engage these neighboring communities to say hey why don't we find a way to for broader participation I don't, mm -hmm. I don't perhaps that's been thought of but i just wanted to throw that out yeah we'll see if we can fold something along those lines in uh, for the community members who might be following along, we are going to be playing this game at the community workshops next month. Um, so at all three of the June workshops, um, we are all looking at maybe potentially scheduling some language specific workshops with our East Side for All folks that, that may be in July, not in June. Um, and give everybody a chance to, to play the game. But we'll also be having the game at pop-ups like Pint, for, uh, Pint with a Planner tomorrow. Um, and then next month, by the way, we're going to be at Locust Cidery at Redmond Town Center, and we're going to potentially try to do one in Downtown Park, and we'll do Pint with a Planner with that ice cream shop, Molly Moon. Yeah. So different kind of pint. Um, <laughs> so at different pop-ups, at different events, and like yeah. I said, we're doing this with the schools as well, uh, but we're also available to uh, have it at different organizations uh, if anybody's interested in having uh, a chance to play with this game at a different setting, just connect with our staff and we'd be happy to try to make that work out. All right, but that is it. That wraps it up for this evening for us. Thank you for playing along. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, Becky. Okay, so now we move on to staff and commissioner updates. Glenn. Uh, just one final thing, uh, if it wasn't mentioned earlier, our next meeting is June 14th and we'll be having public hearings on the park element and the park plans. In addition, we'll also be having a public hearing on the economic vitality element. Okay. Um, so um, they will be published before the meeting, but you, you've seen earlier drafts, but they are on the Redmond 2050 sites, um, the, the current documents there. Uh, we just published our 21 day notification and those um, plan, comprehensive plan updates have been approved by our technical committee. Um, so 
the report will also be in your packet for the public hearing. So just, just an FYI and reminder, June 14th, our next meeting. Thanks. Great. Uh, yeah. Uh, as you can tell from our meeting, saw from our meeting tonight, we have a very busy summer. And summer, I know, is a time for travel for many people. So if you are going to be out of town and are going to miss a meeting, please let me and staff know as soon as possible because we need, you know, we've got a number of public hearings scheduled this summer. We need and a lot of meetings scheduled. We need to be sure that we have quorum. So just as soon as you know what your schedule is and if you're going to miss any meetings, you know, if you know I'm not going to be here August 9th, let us know now so that we make sure that we have quorum. So I, I have some travel second half of July that I'm finalizing, so I'll let you know. Okay, as soon as you know, anybody knows what their calendar is and if they're going to miss a meeting, please let yeah, us know. Yeah, we appreciate that. Just make sure we can time all the hearings and report approvals, et cetera, et cetera, which require a quorum. Okay. Yep, thank you. Yeah, great. Okay, any commissioner news or updates? Other than that, all right, I look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you.